welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. It is appropriate for our celebrity lecture for Women's History Month to have a woman who has certainly made an impressive contribution to history. Among her groundbreaking achievements are her role in opening military aviation opportunities for women and demonstrating that women can not only succeed, succeed but excel in many non-traditional activities. Here is someone who has kept her eye on the prize and really nailed it. So who better than Trish Beckman to tell us about it today? It is my privilege, ladies and gentlemen, Commander Trish Beckman. It's my privilege to be here in front of you. And I do want to recognize the woman whose shoulders I stand on, Iris Critchell. Uh, she is my hero. Um, she is the reason that we women in the military flying now are able to do it because of what she did, accomplished during World War II. Thank you, Iris. <laughs> My agenda, I'm gonna talk about me, some fun things I've done, what is important about history, some pearls of wisdom I always give, and my final thing was a fighter pilot cries. I was born in Huntsville, Alabama in 1952. I'm the oldest of seven children from a lower middle class family. We had the basics, we didn't have a lot of extras, but uh, I think sometimes uh, when you grow up that way, you, you learn a few things and appreciate things you do have once you are an adult. My heritage is mostly German, Irish and Native American. I was inspired into aviation by the US space program. Anybody knows Huntsville, Alabama, they know that's where the German scientists went um, and helped us develop our, our rockets to take us to the moon, and uh, so very proud to be from there. Went to school with some of the children of the German scientists, and uh, it was just a real privilege to be there in Huntsville. We would uh, uh, regularly, the ground would start shaking, the windows rattling, and we go, oh, that's not an earthquake. We know what that is. That's a Saturn V they're testing out there. So it's just a wonderful time, a great inspiration for me. I'm sure that's why I wanted to become an aerospace engineer. So and I served in the U.S. Navy during the Cold War and beyond. So I served from 1970 to 1999. It was a great career. Eight years enlisted, 20 as an officer. Um, again, just every experience was, was wonderful. Right out of high school is when I enlisted the Navy. I wanted to serve in uh, the Vietnam conflict. I had been accepted in the Army's nursing program. They were going to send me to college for four years, make me an army nurse, and then I probably would have gotten to go to Vietnam at that point in time. But even at that point in time, I knew that I was not the nurturing type. I'm the more the warrior type. <laughs> and so, so it just, and I've read the books that the nurses wrote afterwards, and I cry through them because I just, what they, um, what they saw, I don't think I could have handled. So I did what was better for me and went into, into the Navy and uh, had a great career in aviation. I got a commission in 1978 after the Navy sent me to college for four years at North Carolina State University. And the Navy paid for all of my education, paid for my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, flight training, test pilot school. And then I used my GI Bill when I retired to get an MBA. If you're looking for opportunities, when I'm talking to kids, I'm always saying, hey, there are opportunities there. You know, you just need to go find them and go for them. This is my favorite picture of me. I was uh, stationed at McDonnell Douglas then. It was then McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis as a program integrator for the F-18 C and D aircraft. Best job ever. Um, every takeoff was max performance takeoff, afterburner, straight up. Tough life, you know, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Glad it was me. Um, and then I got to go talk to the fleet and talk to them about uh, what was happening with the airplane. So there I was, a uh, lieutenant commander in the Navy, you know, able to actually feed things back into the plant and get things fixed that had gone wrong with F-18. Uh, and almost all those things that went wrong, went wrong at 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and so 
we, we, we got to fix those things before they grounded the fleet for the weekend or whatever. Uh, but it was uh, the best job ever. Um, and it's the best job ever because usually when you have jobs, you get a lot of responsibility and almost no authority to fix it. Well, this one was both. I had responsibility and authority, and uh, plus the flying. I mean, who could beat the flying? <laughs> so so uh, that's, that's what made it one of the best jobs. And also the bosses. Um, managers are so important um, in any job. Uh, these managers that I had, these Navy captains, um, even though they didn't agree with me necessarily, they would always listen to me and give, let me say what I was going to say and then respect me for my opinion. So I spent 28 years total on active duty, then two and a half years as a military support contractor, mainly at Edwards Air Force Base and China Lake. As a matter of fact, uh, my helmet, if you look on it, uh, the last time I flew tactically was in the B-52, so it actually says B-52 on it from Edwards Air Force Base. And then I spent 12 years with Boeing, actually 17 years total, but uh, 13 years at Seattle flying commercial aircraft. And then about four years ago, I came to uh, China Lake and I've been supporting F-18 flight tests there. This was one of the, my favorite pictures also because it shows me and one of the young women from Aviation High School in Seattle. Uh, we were allowed to mentor the kids there that were in the Aviation High School. And so I would use my influence, yeah right, had to get permission of course, uh, to bring them out to the flight line and let them sit in an airplane on the, on the production line. So I've got uh, you know, a bunch of hours and a whole bunch of military aircraft. I got one flight in the Harrier. Uh, that's, that's good for me. I don't have to get a whole bunch of them. So, uh, and I keep telling people like, I'm trying to catch up with Chuck Yeager, but you know, I don't think I'm going to get there anytime soon. Anyway, I've enjoyed all of them. And then I have time in six types of commercial aircraft, Boeing, of course. Okay, my favorite logbook page is uh, from July of 92. When I was at uh, McDonnell Douglas, which became Boeing, as you know, um, I was flying in the F-18 and um, I started flying in the F-15, and then I wanted training in the F-15, and the Air Force said, no, you can't fly in the F-15 because you're a woman. And I said, hmm, and, and, and it's a combat aircraft, and I go, hmm, wonder what the F-18 is. I'm pretty sure it's in a combat aircraft. Well, uh, I have to go back to some pretty far back history to tell you why all that happened. It took me two years inside and outside the chain of command to try to get permission to fly in the F-15 as a woman between 1990 and 1992. And I finally got that permission only because my last ditch effort was to be on NBC Nightly News and explain to the world why um, the company had to fly their own people in the back seat of an F-15 because the Secretary of Defense would not allow a woman to, do, to fly in the back seat of an F-15. So that was on a Monday morning. I get a call saying, hey, Trish, how would you like to go to F-15 training? <laughs> that's, just, that's a really short version of it. So that in, 90, in August, or July of 92, I went to F-15 training at Luke Air Force Base. Uh, I didn't get to fly there. I got in the simulator a lot. Um, and so, but I got to fly in the F-16 because I asked. So I got a couple flights in the F F-16. And then when I got back to St. Louis that month, I flew in the F-18 and the F-15. And so that's why this, this month uh, and this page in my logbook is my favorite because I won a war, a two-year war. <laughs> I want to make sure everybody knows that I'm, I'm a Naval Flight Officer Wizzo type, not the actual pilot. When I uh, was chosen uh, for a naval flight officer. Uh, remember, everybody had to have 20-20 vision uncorrected back then. And mine was pretty awful, uh, but I was in the first group of women, first five women, selected for a naval flight officer in 1980. Um, uh, but I have to caveat that with the first woman since World War II, because the Navy had 100 women who are navigators in World War II. Uh, some of them taught from the ground, others flew, 
They wore air observer wings and they earned flight pay, which was back then half of your base pay because flying was dangerous back then in World War II. Nowadays, it's, our base pay is a lot more. So, you know, it's, it's uh, anyway, so it was 100 women who were uh, on active duty um, who flew. Um, and so there, it's just because there's so few of them that we really don't know much about them. When I was at Boeing in uh, Seattle, the job involved production flight test and ferry flights. And I was a system operator on the production flights. It means I sat in the jump seat, I operated the overhead panel, you know, I operated the pneumatics, uh, electrical and hydraulic systems. Uh, one of the first things I did after we took off is I tried to overpressurize the airplane, make sure it would not overpressurize, that I couldn't physically make that happen. Later on, I took it up to cabin limiting to make sure it would limit uh, where it was supposed to. It will not limit in manual though, so it has to be an auto. And that's, um, so that led to an interesting um, thing that happened on a, on a flight with a Chinese uh, crew on board. Uh, but we survived it because I knew what I was doing. Uh, so, um, and so we did, that's what we, that's what we did uh, on a daily basis. We'd take airplanes uh, out of Renton. We'd fly them for the very first time. You know, I'd never flown before, fly them for the first time. We'd take them over to Boeing Field. Uh, we'd fly with our customer, whoever came to pick it up. And, uh, and then often, if they needed help ferrying their 737 across the big pond to the west, I would go with them. And I was the navigator, I was an FAA certificated navigator. So as a system operator, I understood the systems uh, navigator, and I'm also an aircraft dispatcher. So as a one person, one American on board crew, set a new 737 flying across the Pacific with 20, 30 Chinese people, and which is awesome, actually. So I had about 50 trips to China, uh, and I've loved everyone. Everyone was different. Uh, as you might guess, we would island hop. Uh, we'd go to Hawaii, always had to go to Honolulu. And uh, then we could either go to Guam or Saipan. And what I learned in Guam and Saipan, primarily Saipan, uh, was really amazing about World War II. And then I also flew with our demonstration aircraft, a new aircraft like the 787. So I've been literally around the world in the 737, the 777, and the 787. I had a great time there. But, you know, I kind of got, you know, it's like after a certain point, you know, you do 12, 13 years in a place, okay, it's time to move on. So I decided I want to go back to the military side. So I did, and I'm very happily back with F-18 in China Lake, California. Uh, supporting it, not flying it, but uh, supporting the flight test. Uh, this is just, you know, pictures. Boeing doesn't want me to tell this, but they had to take a navigator with them uh, when we ferried the Italian 767 tanker to Le Bourget, the Paris Air Show, because the flight management computers were fighting with each other. So you could only have one at one time. In order to fly over the ocean, you have to have redundant navigation systems. So I was the redundant navigation system. <laughs> This is a world tour summary. This is the 777. Took us about 61 days, got 168 flight hours, flew over 70,000 miles, 24 cities, 17 countries, and held 38 flights. Pakistan International was the launch customer. This is where we went, kind of all over the place. We visited 19 airlines. This was in just, I just, some of my pictures I took in Dubai and Muscat, Oman. We are out on the water in a boat in Muscat, you know, on, on Liberty, as they say, looking at something on the horizon, we kept looking at it, is that a UFO? No, it's just a, it's an observation deck. This one was a traffic circle in, in Doha, Qatar. And this one, I will take a little bit of time on this one because we did a tribute to Zheng He, and I don't know if you know about him, but he was a very, very famous ship navigator uh, from the early 1400s in China. Well known there, not so well known here maybe. Uh, but um, so we took the airplane there. Uh, we called it Going the Distance, a tribute to Zheng He, because there's a couple books out by a British submarine captain that talks about him. All the evidence this submarine captain has gathered around the world because um, 
the, the story is, and you know, without being there, you can't verify necessarily, but that he sent, they sent a, a fleet of ships to go around the world uh, in, in the 1420s. So I think it's 1421, the year China discovered America. Um, and if you look at the evidence, like supposedly there's a Chinese junk in the Sacramento River that's carbon dated to that time. Uh, and all the things that are in his book that talk about it. Now the issue being that while they were gone, and not all of them returned obviously, while they were gone the palace burned down and it was considered a really bad omen. So they destroyed all the records when they came back, and what records they had in the early 1400s, destroyed them all and went into their isolation period. So there's a lot of things we don't know um, uh, on this side of the pond that maybe they know there uh, from the stories that have t been told along the way. So anyway, he was just, you know, an incredible navigator. Back then, navigators had all the power because, am I still on? Okay, uh, getting a little feedback. Uh, because they knew how to navigate. They knew how, if they knew what time it was and where the sun was or the stars were, hey, they could take you anywhere. Um, and I still, when I did my trips to China, I still took my sextant and I got my sun lines and my moon lines. And, uh, but I also took my handheld GPS, <laughs> just in case. Um, so, but it helped me one time. We were leaving, um, so we were leaving um, Majuro. Uh, the, the trip between Hawaii and Guam is about eight hours. That's about the limits of a 737, you know, with no people on board, you know, basically just a few people. And so, if, depending on the winds, we might have to go southwest to Majuro and then northwest uh, back to Saipan. So it's about, you know, four, four hours, four and a half, three hours, depending on which. And um, so, um, we're departing Majuro and we're in, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, nobody else is out there with us. We're still controlled by Oakland Center though. So we're on HF with Oakland Center. And I'm sitting in the back at the exit row because that's where my GPS will work. You know, it won't work on the flight deck necessarily because if the windows are heated, GPS signal cannot get through it. So there's little lines that go around it, I can't, no GPS signal. So I'm back there and plus, I'm back there because the Chinese flight crew usually smokes. I don't want to be in that, trust me. So, but, uh, so I would, uh, I was back there and I was just noticing, kept making turns, 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 turns. All of a sudden we're headed back the other way. It's like, what is going on? I have to go up and find out what's going on. Well, they were avoiding weather. But they weren't bothering to tell Oakland about it. So, so I was like, oh boy. <laughs> so, anyway, so sometimes things like that would happen, you know. You know, you can tell them up front, you know, they can deviate a little bit for weather, uh, but then they decided they would deviate a lot for weather. So, uh, so that's how I kind of kept track of what they were doing with my GPS, you know, and plus, why don't we keep turning? Um, but I mean, they're generally just fabulous people to work with. The captains didn't speak English very well, but almost invariably, the first officers did. They were great. Uh, they probably had been to flight training in the U.S. or in Canada, and they spoke English well. Uh, so that's how I, I would have to communicate, usually through the first officer to the, the captain. Um, so um, that gets, but trust me, everything I, 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 you know, my personal experience with Chinese crews has been just marvelous, you know, so. Uh, and we're happy to go pay tribute to Zheng Ha. This one was actually me on that trip. It was made with my camera. I found out later. Didn't know what had happened necessarily until later. And so actually I did nap. I did a lot of work on the ground because after we landed, I was preparing for the next flight, next evolution. So uh, I didn't get a lot of sleep. So, okay, last, say five years, I did a short time with an army program called EMARS, uh, King Air Aircraft that has got so many antennas on it, enhanced medium altitude, reconnaissance and surveillance aircraft, that'll tell you all kinds of sensors on board. 
Uh, that was a lot of, that was interesting, trust me. And the B1B and the F-18. I wanted to talk a little bit about the history and I guess challenges that I've, I've faced to get to where I am. Try to impress this upon the kids too. It's important to know where you come from, to understand the sacrifices that people made ahead of you. So the women who flew in World War II made sacrifices that I didn't have to make, not only because they wanted to serve their country, but it helped others. And if you don't know what your history is, you're definitely condemned to repeat it, especially the bad stuff. And you always want to lead and, and teach people about what their history is. When I was in, in high school or college, I mean, math is easy for me. I'm an engineer. History was like, eh, you know, who cares? It's become a lot more important to me as I've gotten older, and it should be important to everybody. So I do talk about leadership, this thing I call that manager directs and a leader inspires. As a two-year-old, you could be a leader. I don't care. Uh, but you have to learn to lead yourself first. And uh, every job is important. I know one of the first lessons I learned in the, in the Navy as an enlisted person was how important the, it was that, that we have clean facilities. That if you're in a place that's dirty and things aren't well kept, how, it really affects your morale. And the Navy taught me how important it was to be clean and organized and, I mean, not always that way, but I try. <laughs> so, but uh, it, every job is important. So when I cleaned compartments, as they call it, uh, when I was enlisted, that was, they were teaching me a lesson, how important that was. And I appreciate the people who do that today because it affects my morale. And, of course, what they also taught me is success of the team is paramount. So that means that we all have to work together uh, to make the team succeed. I'm going to talk about this. Teachers make the difference. The best teachers want me to learn. They want me to succeed. There was one in college, and this was in the uh, mid-70s, a NC State propulsion professor. I'll go ahead and say it. I won't give you his name. Um, walked into the class the first day. He said, you're a woman. You don't belong here. You know, we're talking mid-70s. I was like, okay. He made, his, he made it really difficult for me. I did pass the course, barely. Uh, but um, that's not, you know, <laughs> it's not the way you help people succeed by telling them they don't belong there. Um, but when I went to postgraduate school in Monterey, it's amazing how easy propulsion was, you know, by comparison to my bachelor's degree. So if you're a teacher, please encourage, you know, the kids uh, to follow their dreams, to follow their passions, to do what they need to do with their lives. And, and the best revenge is living well. So do well anyway. Don't listen to the people. Don't take no for an answer. That's my favorite one. My, one of my very favorite women aviators, specifically one from the past is Bessie Coleman. She happened to be black in America, looked out everywhere, could not find somebody to teach her how to fly. This was in the 20s. So she said, well, I will learn French and I'll go to France. And so she did, and she learned how to fly in France. And she came back and she was a barnstormer type. Uh, but uh, her, that was her expression, don't take no for an answer. She said, they can't tell me I can't or I shouldn't. I'm gonna do it anyway, I'm gonna figure a way, I'm gonna find a way to do it. And so that's really um, kind of how my philosophy on why I pushed a couple of things that you know, like the F-15, uh, because you don't, I'm sorry, you don't have the right to tell me I can't or I shouldn't. This one is about finding a mentor, and for this crowd, I think we're all mentors already. Don't allow people to steal your dreams. You're the only person that lives in your body. You have to live your own dreams, so don't let people take them away from you. Find a mentor. Go find somebody uh, to help you with life, whatever profession you want to use, because life is not a closed book test. Learn what the requirements are. A lot of things I teach the youngsters is if they want to fly for the military, first of all, you have to be young because they usually cut it off about 27, 28 years old. Hey, that's young. They might not think it's young at the time, but it is young. And then if you want to fly fighters, do not run marathons because it will lower your blood pressure so much. And that sounds good, right? Lower your blood pressure. Well, when you're trying to 
handle the, the G's in fighter aircraft, you do not want really low blood pressure. You want just average, normal blood pressure. It will help you, help you stay awake when you, when you fly in fighters. The LASIK surgery. Nowadays, guess what? Everybody can have 20-20 vision. <laughs> There's an all laser LASIK out there. Just make sure when you do it that the, you're doing the type that the military will actually approve. Okay, I'm gonna go to this one, Fire Pilot Cries, because it kind of follows along that theme. Up in uh, Seattle, I work at the Museum of Flight a lot, and we bring in women from all over. We brought in Chinese women from China, and Russian women from Russia, and women from all over the world, from Chile or whatever. So we had this Russian woman in, and she had, uh, was just coming off a tour of flying the MiG-29. And uh, so we had a, a great time with her, uh, you know, learning about what she did. And then one day we just saw her, she's sitting there and she's crying. Oh no, what did we do? Did we offend her somehow? We didn't realize we had offended her. And she said, no, nope, um, it's because I've had my one opportunity. I'm never having it again. And you American women can go back over and over and fly fighters. And she was sad for herself, for her lack of opportunity. And that's just one uh, thing that I saw. Uh, I, there's a young lady I know who came over from Russia she wanted to fly for the U.S. military, um, so she came over here as a young woman. She went to school full-time, she worked full-time, she flew full-time, all at the same time, of course. And so she got her degrees, she got her tickets, she got, you know, supported herself, and she became an American citizen. And yes, now she flies for the, for the U.S. Air Force, the Reserve, I think, um, and uh, she's flown as the C-130, and I think she's now flying C-17. And she just got hired by Delta. So, hey, you know, if you've got a dream, the, I mean, these are extreme maybe, but this is how you go for it and get things done. So these are the type of people that I have met along the way that it continue to inspire me, you know, and I feel like they mentor me sometimes. Sometimes I feel like th things aren't going my way, well, I stop and think about what they've been through and how they did it uh, because they, they wanted you. So, pressing upon the kids, of course, opportunities are here. They're not everywhere else. So take advantage of the opportunities that are here. Because if you go to Britain, sure, you got opportunities. It's going to cost you a lot more money. Though. If you go to Iran, probably not going to fly, right? Things are changing slowly. Let me back up to best job in the world, uh, St. Louis, uh, flying the F-18 with all that responsibility and authority to fix things. I had two of the biggest challenges there at the same time. Uh, one was with the Air Force and one was with uh, the Kuwaitis. And you can kind of understand with, with cultural differences why I might have uh, problems with the Kuwaitis. Well, the reason that it was such a, a big deal was because I got there in, in March of 90. Uh, Saddam in, invaded Kuwait in August of 90. And then uh, in January of 91, we went over and liberated Kuwait, right? Okay, so um, we, had, we had started production of Kuwait F-18s. We stopped it because of the war. When the war was over, we went back to it. Um, so I, as the only only F-18 Wizzo uh, from the government side there. Um, I flew in the back seat of their first flight of their two-seat uh, F-18. Um, and then the F-18 was to be delivered to China Lake. And so they invited in a Kuwaiti pilot to fly in the back seat from St. Louis to China Lake. And the, uh, so he came out and there was a big ceremony and the press was there and all this sort of stuff. Uh, the company, and so I, I flew the first flight, he was there. Uh, company guys anonymously came and said, Trish, the Kuwait guy has requested that the ejection seat be changed because you flew in it. And um, I, I was, well, of course, livid, you know. I mean, their culture is one thing, uh, but American women had died and been POWs to save them. And I was more livid for that reason, that they would dare to come to America 
to, uh, and when I flew, the airplane didn't belong to them yet. It was still, you know, a company asset. And so they were coming over here to affect an American woman to an American job in America. And, and plus, women, our American women had died for them. And so I was livid. I almost went to the press right away, but I didn't. Um, I decided I would try to keep things at the lowest level. That's, that's the smartest thing to do, keep things at the lowest level. So I went to my boss, and we actually got the Quake guy to come in. He said, oh, I never said that. And, uh, um, and so he was lying to me. Uh, but anyway, that's what he said. And uh, he, um, so I, I kind of, you know, just said, okay, well, we're just going to see what happens here. So I made sure that every woman at Trine Lake in Patuxent River, Maryland, knew where the airplanes were going, knew what had happened. And I know that every one of them there never missed an opportunity to get in a Kuwait airplane and sit in all the seats that were available. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so, and when I, when I left the company uh, a couple of years later, um, they would never tell me, you know, I couldn't get the official answer. Did you change the ejection seat? Did you, is every, everything between change the ejection seat to nothing, they did nothing. Well, what they gave me when I left the, the company, uh, left the, you know, that, that uh, military job, is they gave me the seat cushion. <laughs> and it has uh, US only on one side and Kuwait only on the other side. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I, you know, again, and I, I had, uh, uh, again, I'd go back to the best bosses in the world, a Navy captain that was there. I should give you his name, but uh, in case you don't want some self-protected, I'll, I'll not give it to you. But uh, um, when we, we would fly the airplanes, uh, production flights, and then the guys would go deliver F-15s to Saudi Arabia or whatever, and our guys would go deliver F-18s to We'd, we'd take them into Egypt for the Kuwaitis to pick up and fly in country from Egypt. And so I went to my boss and I said, I'm gonna fly one of those flights to Egypt, a Kuwait airplane, I'm gonna fly it. And he said, Trish, you're gonna cause an international incident. And I said, you haven't seen one yet until you tell me I can't do this <laughs> because I will take this. You know, I'd, I'd, uh, you know, I just couldn't believe it. So, so I did, I actually took an airplane we flew uh, out of St. Louis, took eight and a half hours, across the Atlantic to Torjon, Spain, another four and a half hours into Luxor, Egypt. And uh, I, uh, we got there, uh, piloted in the front seat, you know, of course, he got out in a hurry. What's going on here? I was taking my time, you know, you know do all the stuff, get out. When I, when, I, when I pull my helmet off, the guard pulled his weapon toward me. I think he was so shocked by seeing a woman. I was like, for about a half a second, I said, this wasn't a good idea, but I, I didn't get shot, so. Um, and then, of course, the, the McDonald Douglas people were there waiting for me, or waiting for us to land in Luxor, and uh, they started helping me out of my dry suit, because we're wearing dry suits. And so, finally, uh, I think I got closure, because the squadron commander actually came over and shook my hand, and that was not something that the guy in St. Louis, he said, when I offered my hand, he said, I don't shake hands. So, um, so, so I finally got, I guess I got closure by doing that um, and just proving a point, if nothing else. Let's go back to F-15. Okay, so, like I said, when I first got there flying F-18, um, the, the, we only have two Wizzos, one male F-15 Wizzo and one female you know, F-18 Wizzo uh, at the plant and uh, at government side. And uh, so I want to fly, uh, I started flying, had several flights in F-15, said, okay, I'd like to get training. And uh, he said, nope, can't do that, you're a woman. He's like, okay, history lesson, Revolutionary War. Women, American women have been in wars, every war, uh, since the Revolutionary War, disguised as men, or later the nurses were allowed in and 1901 and 1908, I think, Army and Navy. And, uh, and then we're allowed to serve in World War I and World War II, but only 
during wartime. That's the only time we're allowed to serve. So after, after World War II, it's like, well, why can't we serve all the time? Why can't we serve in peacetime? Why, I mean, why is it the only time we can serve is when we're in war? Uh, so um, it's the, the Armed Forces Integration Act in 1948 that uh, said, okay, okay, we can have women now in peacetime. Um, they can be 2% of the population, kind of like milk, 2%. Uh, they cannot ever have a higher rank than commander or lieutenant colonel. And um, if they ever get pregnant, they're out. If they marry a guy who's got children, they're out. Um, all these caveats about what women can do uh, after World War II. So um, a lot of that stuff, uh, changed during my, my tenure in the Navy, obviously. Um, so, um, in, there, and there were three laws enacted that prevented women from doing, from serving on ships and aircraft. The Navy had two. One was, you know, for ships, one was for aircraft. The Air Force had one, which was for aircraft. The Navy and the um, Air Force law both said uh, women cannot serve an aircraft engaged in combat missions. So the Navy interpreted it as, hey, if they're flying tests, they're not engaged in a combat mission. The Air Force interpreted it as if, if they could ever go to combat. So this is the reason women could not fly for the Thunderbirds, you know, because an airplane might go to combat. Well, there's no way those airplanes would ever go to combat, but, but that's why you couldn't do it. So, um, so the Navy uh, and the Army, the Army never had any laws. And I, that's, they had policy. They never had laws that restricted women from flying in combat. So they just went along with what the other services were doing. So, so, um, um, so the Navy in 1975, Rosemary Mariner was flying A-7s for the Navy. And in 70, Six, Linda Dumoulin was flying Cobras for the Army. And so we were used to that. You know, Navy and Army were quite used to that. But the Air Force weren't. Air Force women were not. They weren't allowed to do it. And uh, so the, these were the laws we got uh, repealed eventually. Um, so we, what we did, um, uh, those of us who were allowed in to fly in the 70s, uh, did everything we could. We, you know, just as the WASP did our duty, we uh, kicked open the doors we could kick open. We flew the things we could fly, um, and um, you know that sort of thing. So when I came along, and I was the first woman to fly American women, to, women to fly in the F-18 as a, as my job. There certainly was another woman who flew one flight, uh, but I flew uh, in the F-18 as my job. Uh, that was after a couple of Canadian women flew in the F-18. So, um, and then um, the, so then when I asked for the F-15, and this is the way the Air Force interpreted that law as I could not do it. So it took me the two years that it took. A um, friend was in the Pentagon uh, when the Secretary of Defense says, who does she think she is? Um, and uh, so, okay. I am the one who's going to fly in the F-15 eventually. That's who I am. So I did. Um, so, uh, but what happened in between? So we're talking, we just talked about the Kuwaitis and, and Desert Storm. And guess what? The American people were ready for women to be able to fly in combat. They had gone to, into Desert Storm, saved the Kuwaitis, been POWs, been killed. Um, Marie Rossi died uh, when her helicopter hit a, an uncharted uh, microwave tower, um, and she and her crew. And uh, what we did was prove that we are willing to do this. And so the American people said, okay. And we, the, right away, the uh, House passed the, their version of the bill that repealed the, the combat exclusion laws. This was in 91, after we liberated Kuwait. Um, the Senate balked, and so there were a bunch of us who went and walked the Senate halls in our uniforms, and we were there with lobbyists. We were not lobbying, we were just subject matter experts, and most of them are Navy, a few Army, one Air Force, 
The Air Force women were told by <coughs> the chief of staff, uh, you, you better not go. If you go, you better not be in uniform. One woman did get it, get the, the, uh, the word, so she was there in uniform. So uh, we educated the Senate, we got it passed. They repealed the two laws. Later, they repealed the ship law a year or so later, I think. And uh, so, um, but meanwhile, I was there flying the two combat aircraft before the laws were repealed. They were actually, uh, well, actually, they were repealed in 91. The president signed them out of, of uh, existence, but they decided to study it for two years. So the policy didn't change until 93. So, um, and the, so even though the, the laws have been repealed, I still had to fight with the uh, Air Force and Secretary of Defense to get to fly in the F-15. So um, it's, and I may, um, I don't mean this to be a downer or anything because it's not, because it's a fight worth fighting and I'm glad I did it. Um, but it's, um, you know, it just amazes me that it was not that long ago in our history that we had to, had to make that happen. Uh, so, you know, uh, there are a lot of us Navy women who basically sacrificed our careers for, because we went to Congress, you know, went to the Senate. Uh, but that's okay. You know, I can look at myself in the mirror <laughs> in the morning. So uh, I think that's what counts. So, and then, and then since then, we've had this wonderful cadre of women out there in combat, flying all, every type of aircraft um, and doing, doing our nation proud um, as they do it. So very happy to be part of that, starting with the WASP and my generation doing what we could, and then the young ladies now who do it, and along with their brothers uh, flying in combat. So, and then I get to meet a few of them at China Lake now. So, really cool stuff. So, okay, I think that's um, uh, enough history. Yes, how about questions? Any questions? Uh, did I carry a qual? No, I did not carry a qual in the F-18, but I do have 39 traps on board Abraham Lincoln. Uh, when I was, um, so I went, to, um, uh, after this wonderful job in St. Louis, I went back to test pilot school as an instructor. And um, so, I had the opportunity to fly in a lot of things, but, but uh, I guess really that was before I went to St. Louis. After I'd finished test pilot school as a student uh, in 1988, I actually got to um, lead the S3 Viking, uh, Lockheed Viking team, which no longer exists in the service. Uh, but I led it for a year. And one of our jobs at Patuxent River, Maryland was to certify the aircraft carriers so we would be the first ones to fly aboard and, and launch off the carrier. So I went, uh, got to go on board Abraham Lincoln and um, we certified it. I've got 35 traps in the, in the S3 and then four in the F-18. Now, when you're doing this, it's pretty interesting actually. Um, normally, if you're a carrier pilot or crew member, you would know that you get launched about 15 knots over your stall speed. So you're flying, you know, you're, at the end of the stroke, your airplane's actually flying because you're not gonna stall and fall in, in the water. Uh, so we're testing this. Now S3, we're doing eight knots excess. I had, and I was in the right front seat, the Kotak position, and I would have the ejection channel in my hand because it felt like we were not going flying. And then the F-18, six zero knots excess. Knocks the breath out of you, it really does. So, I mean, I, the, I mean, of course, the launches are along for the ride, you know, it's really cool. Um, I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> I love the upside down backwards, you know, pulling G's, I just love it. But I would notice, with the, the first one that happened, I thought, something wrong, you know. And uh, then I noticed that the, the, uh, the, uh, Pilot actually coughed first before he act, before he talked. So it's like, okay, it's not just me. <laughs> so, but you can handle a lot of G's this way. So I talk a lot about G's when I'm talking to kids. But I think this this crowd probably knows about them well enough. So um, so anyway, yeah, I'm very lucky to have 39 traps. So 
Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. How did I handle any restrictions on my height? Good question. <laughs> uh, remember way back when, when you have to have 20 20 vision and you had to have, be five foot four, at least in the Navy, to fly. I am not five, I'm five one, maybe. I'm still, I don't know. Um, well, just before, you might remember that women went to the Naval Academy in 76 and graduated in 1980. And so they had to figure out how to handle, you know, what are we going to do with these women that might be short and still want to fly? So, and good thing they did because, you know, we have some wonderful astronauts who are not, not much taller than me. Um, but uh, anyway, so they decided they were going to do it by anthropometric codes, which means how long is your arm? Can you reach the control panels? How long are your legs? Can you reach the rudder pedals? And how, how tall do you sit? And I passed. So, so that's how they did it, and that's how they got around it. So, and, and really, doesn't that make sense? Whether this arbitrary height thing, you know? Yeah, I'm not sure I understood everything. Uh, so during my career, as I look back over my career, um, uh, how do you, how do you get mentors to teach women or to help women? Yeah, how would I, how would I do that today? Uh, we have uh, several organizations that actually help, and plus individually, uh, we mentor. Um, so uh, women military aviators um, were formed by the WASP uh, to help the, in the, in the 70s, to help us uh, uh, and mentor us. Uh, how we do this. Of course, they wouldn't, I mean, you know, I mean, there's certain things they could help us with and certain things that had changed by then, but um, so we have organizations like that um, and, of course, encouragement. Uh, but you know, if you're the only one or you're the first one uh, at a squadron, it really doesn't matter. You can gonna have to go through it yourself, you know, it's, and, but uh, I was lucky. Um, that they had, there were women pilots that went to the squad, C-130 squadron ahead of me, um, and uh, they went through stuff, uh, and uh, and they they made it easier for the rest of us because the guys kind of got used to there was a woman there, and then when the others came, it became less of a big deal. And of course, um, the the only the best thing that we ever did, of course, was just concentrate on the job and do the best we could. And you know, prove to them that we were at least as dedicated as they were. Uh, so, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, toward the end of my tour, um, the skipper had designated the top four people women. And uh, so, one, two, three, and four were women. And uh, I asked him why, and he said, "Because not only they're as the, are they as good, they smell better." <laughs> so, and I told him that was sexist. <laughs> so, but no, it's because we really did work very hard uh, because we wanted to be there. So we wanted to serve our countries in that capacity. So, so and I think just encouraging each other to, is the best way. So, but, and now there are other organizations like Women in Aviation International and 99s and all kinds of really great organizations that help encourage and give scholarships and things like that. So once I enlisted in the Navy, how did I get to flight training? I think that's the question. Okay. So, uh, enlisted in the Navy in 1970, went to boot camp in Bainbridge, Maryland. Does not exist anymore. Didn't exist uh, two or three years later. Um, got, um, I had gone in um, in the aviation side, so I was uh, an airman recruit, airman apprentice, that sort of thing. Uh, and. Um, I was selected for um, training devices man, trade of men, which included flight simulators. And so what I did, I went to Millington, Tennessee, learned how to fly, learned how to fly, learned how to operate and maintain flight simulators. And uh, so because back then in the early 70s, um, the pilots in Washington, D.C., stationed at the Pentagon or wherever, still had to get four hours a month to, in order to get their flight paid. So we had simulators, we had aircraft on the Navy side of the field at Andrews Air Force Base. 
so that they could get their time and get their flight pay while they were in desk jobs. After, you know, a few years after that, that changed. So I, um, so I was operating maintaining flight simulators. We flew in our VIP aircraft, we flew admirals and congressmen and senators around. I have some good stories about some of them, let me tell you. Uh, anyway, but, uh, and because they're senators and, you know, senators who brought their wives and admirals who brought their wives on board the aircraft, they would decide they wanted women flight attendants. So I got to be a Navy flight attendant. So I got, uh, that's another story. Uh, you're getting me off on another story here. Uh, so, so, um, so we were considered, um, we weren't air crew, we're not non-crew, but we flew as, did the same job as the guys. We did the weight and balance, we did the refueling of the aircraft, we served coffee, okay. Uh, but we weren't allowed to wear air crew wings or get flight pay, so, all right. Got half of it. I can't remember what they called it. Anyway, so we, in other words, we did the same job as the men, but we weren't allowed to, the same recognition or the same amount of pay for it. So I, there's Trish saying, why can't we be air crew? And, uh, you know, here I'm 19 or 20 asking the captain, why can't I be air crew? And he says, because women can't be air crew. And I said, where is that written down? And it wasn't, and we got to be air crew. So... But uh, this, you know, things, things are, you know, if you don't know, I mean, I'm always, that's why I ask. I, they can never give me a yes answer unless I ask. So that's what I'm looking for is a yes answer. So, okay, so, so then I flew as a flight attendant, uh, got to go to Hawaii and to London, you know, that was a tough life, you know, but, um, but I really enjoyed it. Now, when uh, the POWs came back, um, I was very lucky uh, to take one of them from Andrews Air Force Base to his home in Tennessee. And uh, so that was kind of the highlight of being a flight attendant um, for the Navy. So, um, but, so while I was there operating simulators, maintaining them, flying as a flight attendant, I heard about a program called NESEP, Navy Enlisted Scientific Education Program. Because back then, the Navy didn't have enough engineers, scientists as officers, and they decided to use this program called NESEP to send sailors to college so that they would become engineers and, of course, stay in the Navy and uh, contribute that way. And so that's what I did is I applied for NESEP, got accepted, uh, went to you know four years of college. Interesting thing was that they paid me to go to college, so I was a E5, E6 most of the time, um, and they pay my tuition fees and books. So all I really did was wear my uniform once a week and then collect my paycheck, and that was pretty much my military duties. Uh, but so I graduated in 1978. Women pilots had come into the Navy in 73, Army 74, Air Force 76. So, uh, but we didn't have any women NFOs yet. So I had to, not that I had to, well, I did really, I had to wait a couple of years until the program opened for women who need help with their, their site. <laughs> so, uh, so I went to Naval Space Surveillance System in Dahlgren, Virginia, got to work with uh, NORAD and also with the fleet uh, for a couple of years as an aerospace engineer. So, and this is when GPS was being developed too, so it was pretty exciting times, so. So um, again, when the program opened, one, one Navy captain who happened to be at NORAD said, Trish, get ready, get your application ready, they're about to open it. And uh, I, I served, <laughs> I did, I was ready. And so I got selected as one of the first five women uh, for NFO. Uh, but, you know, again, and I kept telling people, you know, I wanna fly, I wanna fly, but, you know, we didn't know if it ever happened. Uh, so, but it did. Okay, so, um, so I, I, here I am, wanting to fly, wanting to fly, don't have the opportunity in the military, and uh, decide, okay, and the question is, why did I go ahead and try to do it on my own? And yes, I did. Um, and uh, so I flew a few flights with this one instructor. He scared me. 
It really scared me. He had landed one of the trees, and he was just really difficult to, I don't think he should have been an instructor. Uh, so I decided, okay, this is enough of this, and I knew I was going off to flight training anyway, so I said, okay, later, when I have more money, I'll do this, and I'll find a different instructor. And, uh, but since then, I've had you know, plenty of money to do it with, but I've run out of time. You know, it's just, I've got other interests, than, but I still do intend <laughs> to get my private license. <laughs> so, I'll get there. <laughs> so. Okay, talking to a young women who are flying like in combat today, so whether they have any particular uh, challenges that they face. Um, I, I can't say that they harp on things that I talk about that, you know, I, I don't hear them saying that you don't belong here um, or you're not as good. I never hear anything like that. I think that more of the challenges that they have are because they want families too, that I hear, you know, they want to figure out how they can do this, you know, and why not? We want our best people having kids, right? So, so and they're our best people, uh, male or female. Uh, so, uh, so that, that's really the biggest challenges they have to try to fit family into um, uh, the, the time frame when they're not flying. Uh, in combat or whatever, so, so I think, and I'm sure they have maybe other issues. Uh, used to be, it was like, my boots don't fit right, you know, because they're, well, they were built for guys, you know. Uh, I didn't care, if, if I don't care if my boots didn't fit right at all, I was, if it meant I was going flying, I was going flying, I didn't care. Now they can care about stuff like that. So, I guess that's the, and I hope, and I hope it continues that way. I haven't heard um, since the, the initial women who went flying in combat, there was a lot of pushback and feedback. I just haven't heard that much these days. So I'm hoping that's still the case. So, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.